How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood. Good morning. It is great to see everybody this morning. We have a good crowd. We're grateful that you're here. We're thankful for some visitors that we have today, and you are our honored guest. Before we uh, begin our service today, our worship, uh, Bob and, and David and Earl are going to pass out uh, something that we think is very important. So you guys would pass this out, and then I'll give a little background on this. As everybody knows, we are going to be looking for a new pulpit minister. And so what they are passing out uh, is mandatory, not optional. Can't leave today until you fill that out and give it back to somebody. Uh, we're, we're usually not like that. But what we, we have there, give us five characteristics, traits, uh, that you would like to see in our new preacher. And it should be easy to do. There should be pens or pencils in, uh, in the pew. So I'm going to give you a couple minutes to look at that and please fill that out. And that's for everybody. You young guys over here, young girls. I know you're talking, but Holly, fill one, you got to fill this out. We want, your, we want everybody's input. Because this is not a decision that just the elders are going to make. This is a decision that we're all going to make together. And so we want to know what everybody is thinking. This is not us five in the uh, going, we need a 30-year-old guy and you guys all want a 50-year-old guy. Um, so please fill this out. It's, it's extremely important. That is correct, yes. <laughs> and I know there are some people that are not here this Sunday, and we're going to give those folks a chance to do this next Sunday as well. But when we're done with those, please give them to one of the elders. Thank you. 
Yes. Just to remind everybody that there, I think you did, there will be another opportunity next Sunday for those that aren't here. Also, if there are anyone who's, who's not able to give a written in person, they can contact, email, or text any of any of them. Correct. Correct. Did everybody hear that? We just, we, we value your input on this. We, it is completely necessary. It does not have to be five. No. But it is up to if you can only think of one or two, that's that's fine as well. Just a couple more seconds and then we will begin our service. Don't, you can sign it if you want to. That's up to you. It's optional. Okay, before we begin our worship service, let's go to God in prayer. Father, I, th I thank you for our time together this morning. I pray that you will be the focus of our, of our worship and our fellowship. I thank you for all who are here. I thank you that uh, uh, you have blessed us in so many ways. And this morning as we uh, think about uh, who will occupy uh, this pulpit after Greg, I pray that you will lead us in the right direction, that you will provide the right, the right person at the right time for the job here uh, in the future. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Our theme this morning is, uh, <clears throat> I say, part two of last week, I guess, kind of. Uh, we're looking more at Psalm 51, uh, and it's a sinner's prayer, and thinking about our, our sin and the bondage that we're, we've been delivered from. And so our songs will kind of also follow along that. There should have been two that were sent out. I hope you all had a chance to listen to them. One of them is in the book. So, you know, I would usually assume that, oh, if it's in the book, you know it. But I grew up with a songbook that has like a thousand songs in it, and... I know I didn't know all of them, so, <laughs> but I hope you all had an opportunity to listen to them. Uh, I was at a singing last night in Brentwood. It was amazing. It was a fantastic experience, but my voice is tired from that. So if I give out, then y'all just keep going, and we'll see if you actually listen to the songs. Yeah. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole? This is a song that I will lead 
during football season if Alabama won on Saturday because the second verse talks about the rolling tide. And so that's just my little way of slipping it in there. <laughs> but, you know, if there's a song about volunteers, you know, maybe we'd sing that one too if Tennessee won. But we're going to sing it now and it's going to be a safe environment, you know, because there's no sports really going on. So <laughs> Jesus saves or we have heard the joyful sound. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves. on the giving and the Lord's Supper. We're going to sing What the Lord Has Done in Me. This is one of the new ones. Uh, it's in your book. It's number 902. Uh, I think the recording that sent out had verse, chorus, verse, chorus, you know, like normal, but this version has it as all three verses and then the chorus after. So we'll sing it that way. <laughs> Let the weak say, I'm strong. Let the theme this morning involves water, and so I thought it might be wise to share this verse from Mark chapter 9, verse 41, as we think about giving. I tell all of you with certainty, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to the Messiah will never lose his reward. You think about um, a cup of water, it's such a small thing. Yet there is great reward in that. And we, through our collective giving, have been able to do more. When you think about the wells in Africa that quenched a deep thirst there, but you think beyond that and you think about the many souls that have been touched because of the gifts that have been given.
people who needed and were thirsting for living water. And through these gifts today, we're able to give that great blessing. Let's think about that as we pray. Father, we're thankful that you are the great giver, that you teach us how to give, that you teach us the benefit of giving, and that you teach us there is great reward in that, Father. And we pray that with the gifts given today, that if there is a thirst for water, that that thirst will be quenched. But Father, beyond that, we pray that if there is a thirst for spiritual water, for living water, that that thirst will be quenched by the gifts we give today. Lord, we ask that you bless each giver and each gift. We thank you in the name of Jesus who gave all. Amen. So in keeping with our theme of water today, I'd like to tell you a story that sounds almost like it's about me, but it's certainly not about me and this is not about me, or it may sound about like it's about me and three of my friends, but it's not that either. I hope by the end of my remarks that you'll realize that this story is really about each of us. But this story begins nearly 50 years ago. I was a sophomore in college and through my great good fortune I was asked by three seniors in college to share an on-campus apartment which was a big deal probably only happened because my brother older brother was one of the three he was an engineer and he would intern uh, every other quarter we had quarters and he went to Huntsville Alabama worked with a space program there but it also worked with a church there and that church took him on a rafting trip, something that we had never been exposed to. And that rafting trip was on the Chattooga River. Does anyone know that river? Wow, very few. Well, it sits on the border of uh, South Carolina and Georgia, uh, just below the mountains of North Carolina, I guess. And if you happen to have seen the movie Deliverance somewhere in your lifetime or even heard about it, that is the river. And so he went on that river with a large crowd of church friends and also several guides and had a wonderful time and such a wonderful time that when he finished that trip, he bought, I guess we call them funyaks, inflatable boats uh, that would fit four to six people and decided he would uh, go rafting again sometime. And so at the end of that school year, we resolved, the four of us, that we would go on a rafting trip on that same river but since he had been once and had a guide, he knew what to do. And so we didn't need any help. And so we went down there, the four of us, and uh, it had been raining torrentially for a couple of days. And on the Friday that we arrived there, the clouds were still heavy and, the, and that stream was swirling. And it was at flood stage and no one could go on that river. They wouldn't allow anyone on that river that day. But fortunately, the next day, the river was just below flood stage. So we, in our wisdom, launched out that day, the four of us, for a three-hour cruise. Um, 
and without a guide. And so off we went. We were young, we were invincible, right? We got to the first ledge, which is an eight foot drop. I was in the front of the boat and we went over that ledge and the boat stayed upright and I looked back and there was nobody in the boat. <laughs> they were left behind and in fact, uh, one of the paddles, wooden paddle, sturdy wooden paddle had broken somehow, could as easily have been a leg or an arm. But I was left to kind of try to slow the boat down until they could float down and get back in the boat. That happened, we went downstream to the second ledge. Well, we were a little bit older and wiser by then. <laughs> we're not totally foolish, so we got out of the boat, hoisted it on our shoulders and walked around the second ledge. But we went on down that stream with the water still raging and we thought we knew what we were doing at that point. We gained some confidence. We know you're supposed to hit the V, that's right, because that's, that's the current of the water. You hit the V as it goes over the narrows and you will float right through. So we got to the end of that ride and there's a place there called Bull Sluice. And I don't know exactly how it got its name, but I think it's because there's a wall of, of rocks on your left and then there's a huge boulder on the right that's probably about as big as this auditorium. And all of that raging river is funneled into a very narrow place and it rushes through like a bull would rush through. Well, we thought that you're supposed to hit the V, right? Well, you're not. You're supposed to stay real close to that big rock and at the last minute swing into the current and you will float safely through but we hit the V. And that water, when it hit the V, it would splash with great force and rise in the air with great speed, which is what we did. <laughs> and our boat went up in the air, and I only know by what I was told what happened in the next few, I don't know, 30 seconds at least. My brother was safely to the shore. The other two were caught in what's called a hydraulic, a keeper. It churns back. It keeps you in there, Some, sometimes fatally so. Um, and one was on top of the other. It was not a good circumstance, but somehow they escaped. I don't know how. Well, I, being in the front of the boat, was downstream. But I didn't come up until I was, I don't know, 100 feet maybe downstream. And I was under for a long time, and they kept looking for me, and finally I surfaced. But in, in the process, I lost my glasses. So you're saying, what's the point of the story? That once you could see and now you're blind? <laughs> but no, it's just the opposite. Once I was blind and now I could see. We thought we were young, we were invincible. We thought we could survive anything. I saw that day how powerless I was in the face of a nature created by a God. We were powerless against that, the forces of this world and even less powerful than the God who made them. And that was an important lesson for me to learn. Um, I'd like for us to think about that as we think about this scripture from Psalms chapter 18 verses 16 through 19. He reached down from on high and took hold of me. He drew me out of deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemy from my foes who were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my disaster, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a spacious place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. I think the Lord played a role in what happened that day. Uh, I think at that time, 19 people had lost their lives at Bull Sluice. We could easily have been numbers 20 through 23 that day. But we were rescued, and we were once blind, but now we saw. But isn't that the way of this world that, that we find out at some point how powerless we are and how powerful the unseen forces are? And between our own weakness and their power whispering in our ear, we are sinking in our sins. We have no hope of recovery. But he reached down and he rescued us. Let's think about that as we pray this morning. Father, as we take this bread, we remember that 
you didn't just reach down into this world, you came down into this world in the person of your Son. And as we take this bread, we remember him in the flesh and remember that he came to push us to the shore as he was sucked under, that he gave his life in the process to save us. And Father, we are awed by your great goodness and by the wonderful plan that you put in place, an unforeseeable, unimaginable plan that brings about our salvation. Help us to think about these things as we think about your son. And it's in his name that we pray. Shall I pray again? Father, we thank you again for your great love and for your great goodness that we, though unworthy and drowning in our sins, yet you reached out to us and came down to us and pulled us out and put us in a spacious place and have an even more spacious place and gracious place prepared for us only because your son was willing to come was willing to, as he rescued us, give his own life. And Father, we remember that sacrifice now as we think about the blood he shed in the process. And we love you for it. We thank you for it. And we pray in his name. Amen. thinking about our sin and our deliverance from bondage and we've sang a lot about Jesus but our lesson you know comes from the Old Testament and you know Jesus wasn't you know born he didn't die yet so bondage to them was you know the the slavery that they were in or the captivity they were in in Babylon or whatever or their bondage from sin their deliverance from that came from the sacrifice of of, of a sheep or, or whatever and as our, our lesson is coming from the Old Testament, you know, well, we don't have many songs that sing about sacrifice and our bondage of sin being taken away by bulls and goats because we're told that that couldn't remove sin. But Jesus could. And that's why we've sang about Jesus when we think about our deliverance from sin. This is the other new song, Ignore the Number, that does not 
have anything to do with your songbook, but this song is absolutely gorgeous. Um, I discovered this uh, listening through uh, a Bible college lectureship uh, singing, and uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful, beautiful song uh, about Jesus drawing us closer to him as we're here and in this life and the storms of this life. Uh, would you stand as we sing this song? Jesus, draw me ever nearer as I labor through the storm. You have called me to this passage and now lesson about Psalm 51 without singing, Create in me a clean heart, O God. This will be our last song before our lesson in our scripture reading. <laughs> Create in me a
Psalm 51. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise, for you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then they shall offer bulls on your altar. Would you bow with me, please? Holy Father, as we read this powerful psalm, we know, Father, that it has been preserved to help us in our own confession and to help us, Father, as we, as we seek hope. And even as David, Father, was confronted with the depth of his own depravity and sin and recognize it would take a work from you to create a clean heart in him, Father. We, we recognize and acknowledge the same. And we uh, rejoice, Father, that you blot out our sins. And after this Lord's table, we recognize the cost it was to you to be able to do that. We thank you, Father, for Jesus. And Father, even as David longed that he could teach others after learning from his mistakes, may that be our heart as well. Father, as people who have been redeemed and forgiven and restored, Father, may we have the desire uh, to share with others uh, the enthusiasm, the, the, the willingness uh, to make your ways known. Uh, and Father, we know you've answered David's prayer in preserving this psalm. There is so much we can learn regarding sin and you, O Father, and salvation. Please bless Greg as he brings the message to us this morning. Father, we know that your word will not return to you void, and we pray that it will have the effects on our hearts that you desire. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Signal Mountain. It is a pleasure to be together and worship, isn't it? Here we are to worship. Uh, Psalms 51 is a sinner's prayer. Does God hear sinners? Well, who else in, their world, in the world is there for him to hear, right? God knows us. God, he knows our hearts. He listens to those who seek him. But God also says things about those who sin. There's a difference in sinners. Um, if you read, listen to these verses. Psalm 66, 18 says, Come and hear all you who... Fear God. Nope, nope, that's not the one I want. 66, 18, sorry. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. A sinner who cherishes his sin is not going to be heard by God. Look at uh, Proverbs, next book. 
In chapter 21, in verse 13, whoever closes his ear to the cry of the needy or poor will himself call out and not be heard. Those who shut their ears to those in need, God doesn't listen to. Look at chapter 28 of Proverbs, verse 9. Proverbs 28 and verse 9. If one turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. If we turn away from listening to God's words, our prayers are not heard. Listen to Isaiah. Isaiah in chapter 1 and verse 15. Talking about these people who are a burden of, because they carry their sins all the time. He said, when you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even when you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. A people who hate and have bloodshed lose access to God. Listen to chapter 59 of Isaiah in verse 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear dull that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. And then James, chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. If anyone lacks faith, no, let him ask in faith. If you're going to pray, ask in faith with no doubting. The one who doubts is like the wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. That person should not suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. A better question than does God hear sinners is what kind of sinners does God hear? What kind of sinners does God listen to? Jesus spoke of a tax collector and a Pharisee who came to pray. Remember that story? One prays, God, I'm so glad I'm not like other men. You know, I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. So glad I'm not like that sinful tax collector over there. Aren't you proud to have me on your team? And walks away. But the tax collector wouldn't even lift his eyes to heaven, smote himself in the breast and said, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Jesus asked, which one went away justified? Which sinner was heard? We need to look at this and think about it. The heading of Psalms 51, if you turn back there, the, just the heading itself says a lot. In this psalm, we have these ancient words written above the psalm, which are not a part of what David wrote. But it says to the choir master, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba, or gone into Bathsheba. Now last week we went through 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12, that tell of David's sin with Bathsheba, how he attempted to cover it up, and finally how David had Bathsheba's husband Uriah killed in battle. And then that was chapter 11. Chapter 12 tells us how God sent Nathan, the prophet, to David with God's rebuke. In this event in David's life, we saw a case study of how sin captures sinners and how the struggle to escape from the consequences of sin apart from God's way of confession, repentance, and discipline. Trying to get out of sin our way can take us to darker places than we ever dreamed we'd go and keep us there longer than we ever thought we'd stay. Question. Question arises. Who is vulnerable to this kind of sin? Look in the mirror, right? Did not the Apostle Paul say, I buffet my body and make it my slave, lest after preaching to others I myself might be a castaway? And he told the Corinthians, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest what? He fall. We need to know 
ourselves and our weaknesses as well as know where our strength comes from. Be strong in the, in the Lord and in His mighty power. That's where our strength comes from. Not in ourselves. Hebrews chapter 2 one and following says, we must pay more careful attention to what we've heard, lest we drift from it. We dare not neglect so great a salvation which God has given us through Jesus Christ. To neglect or to set apart that salvation is terribly dangerous. So last week we saw how David, a man after God's own heart, sinned. And we also noted that God had said to David, David had every Good reason not to do this evil. Did he not? God lists it for him. David was chosen by God for kingship. I took you out from following after sheep to leading my people. David had the Holy Spirit in him. He knew it. David had full knowledge of God's laws. David wrote scriptures. David loved God. David already had many wives. But David fell hard. The laws that David broke call for the death sentence. Adultery, murder, and coverage of adultery. Lying. Question. To such a sin, what should the judge of all the earth do? Nadab and Abihu brought unauthorized fire to kindle the offering of God, and God struck them dead. Uzzah, the ark of God is on an ox cart. The ox stumbles and he touches the ark to keep it from falling, and God struck him dead. Ananias and Sapphira lied about an offering they were giving to the church, and God struck them both dead. David committed adultery, tried to cover it, and did so by having... The husband killed, and God covered his sins. Does that strike anybody? You think, what? Yes, David's sins were covered. They were covered by God. That's not fair, right? Did you know David did not get off scot-free? Did he? Not on your life. There were consequences, and they were, there were heavy consequences. And these consequences of his sin followed David. In fact, as God said, the sword will not depart from your house, David. And it was with him all of his life. Even a cursory reading of his life after this sin shows us that David never got over this regret. If you read it, you'll see it. When David's son, later, Absalom, led a rebellion against David, and it looked like he might even be successful, David, he's away from Jerusalem. The soldiers are going out to fight for David, and he says to them, be gentle with the young man, Absalom. For my sake. Joab killed Absalom as he was hanging with his hair caught in a tree. What happened when David got the news? The Bible says David wept bitterly, crying, Oh, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, my son. Listen to this. Would to God I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. God covered David's sin. That did not mean that God took away all the consequences of that sin from David. So what do we learn here? What do we learn? This is part B of last week's lesson. In Romans chapter 7, Paul describes sin's grip and its bondage. And how the law awakens it within us. Don't do that. Oh, don't do what? That's kind of what our flesh does, isn't it? And we hear in desperation what 
happens to us because of sin. Paul writes in verse 24, Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Not wretched man that I was, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this bondage or body of death? Okay, pause again here. Paul is not describing the pleasures of sin that lure us into the trap, is he? No. He's describing what sin does to us once it gets its hooks in us. For those who partake of the forbidden fruit and become trapped by sin's grip, that's what he's describing. Sin, listen, sin steals our purity, kills our bodies, and destroys our relationship with God. And often... Most of the time, sin is a slow death. A slow death, a slow suicide. Addiction to sin leads to death and hell. And the hell starts before you get there. Who will rescue us from this? Who will deliver us from this body of death? Let those words sink in. Let God's word shine the light of truth on the lures of sin. Let me say it again. The lures of sin. Young folks, listen to me, and old folks too. Sin is alluring. That isn't it? And it comes in all kinds of forms. Forms that we think we have to have. Forms that we will give ourselves to thinking we're doing a good thing sometimes. Because we're not listening to God. Bathsheba looked beautiful. She was alluring to David's flesh, his heart, and his mind. In the garden, that forbidden fruit looked desirable to, to Eve after the serpent got her attention on it. Remember that? He filled her mind with lies. You won't die. God's keeping something from you. Don't you, don't you want to have this? Doesn't it look good? Don't think about God right now. Think about yourself. Most people don't go into sin praying or praising God, do they? That's why the Bible says pray without ceasing, doesn't it? <laughs> in everything, give thanks. And if you're in trouble, be praying. If you're happy, be praising. Praising and praying. Good life. God-centered life when it's focused on Jesus Christ. Think about, here's, here's what the devil says, think about what you could have if you take this. Don't be afraid of God. He's just keeping you from having what you want. Besides, he'll forgive you. He's merciful. Go ahead. Don't miss out. Take it. Do it. That's bait for the trap. Is it not? It's on your screens, on your phones, on your TVs. It's on your radios. It's on your listening devices, whatever they are. Sin is just being poured all around us, isn't it? I mean, the world's just pouring it on right now, is it not? It's like free fall all around us. So you want to say, well, in today's world, think about all your, what all your friends are doing and all your peers are doing. There's so many traps to this. Justin Hart, love Justin. He put together a deep sea fishing recently trip and we, those few of us who got to go on that, uh, caught our limit. I mean, <laughs> those fish were ready to be caught. And on the way back, we even caught a nice, is it Wahoo? Help me here. That's the right word, okay. Wahoo, oh, Yahoo, not a Yahoo, it's a Wahoo. Big fish though. And it was on a trolling line. Wham, hit that thing, Whirr, here goes the line singing out and stop the boat, we got one on. And, Marcus is out there reeling her in, and Grant is over here reeling it in, and finally we get the thing in the boat. Wow. It was pretty neat. What do you think happened to those fish? They were caught, killed, filleted, cooked, and eaten. And if any escaped, they did so with a hook still in their mouth. A scar. Sin leaves scars, does it not? This is true even for the forgiven, is it not? What does that do? 
Once we're set free from sin, that sin this is really neat in Brent's class because I was all loaded for that one, Brent. Uh, that sin motivated it motivates us. It can. It's going to motivate you. Sin will motivate you. And if you're set free from it, it can motivate you to do better. It can motivate you for a lot of things. Like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, I am the least of all the apostles. I don't deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And that I worked harder than all the rest. Yet not I. He's quick to say, yet not I. But the grace of God that was in me. It motivated Paul. Paul's former sins served to motivate him to serve Christ even more. In fact, before Paul was even baptized, when Ananias came to him, God, through Jesus Christ, spoke to Ananias and said, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And Paul did suffer, did he not? But you know, he wore those stripes of his faith as a badge of honor. All of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Not one of us is saved by our righteous lives. Only through the blood of Jesus Christ can anyone be saved. It's true that some fall harder than others and some stay there longer than others, but don't be comparing yourself like that. That's not our job. Recovery from sin can be good for you. It can work to humble you and protect you from future temptations to sin. God's gracious forgiveness can be a powerful tool for God's glory to help us identify with other sinners who are trapped in the sins that we ourselves have been set free from and go to offer them the way of, of release and of freedom. As David says at the end of Psalms 51 here, listen to this. He says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be returned to you. They will turn back to you. God, if you use me, if, even though I'm broken and messed up here, if you forgive me and, and cleanse me and use me, open my mouth and I will proclaim your praise. And others who are sinners will be drawn to you. Because if you can save me, you can save anybody. Isn't that great? Sin can work that way. That's what Paul himself said. Of sinners I am chief, but he sets me up as exhibit A. I'm the one. If God can save me who are who was trying to kill off the church, he can save anybody. Just turn to him. Seek him. Let him free you. God is so good. God amazingly knows how to work all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purposes. Even people who fall hard like David. You know, sin leaves scars, but those scars can serve as reminders even as a testimony of God's grace in our lives. What has David's sin and God's grace accomplished for God's glory? When you read the story and you read the Psalms that he wrote about it, I'll tell you what they do to me and I think they do to all of us. I would say as I read David's sin, God's amazing grace seems more accessible to me. Doesn't it to you? If he'll cover David's sin, he can cover mine too. You know, when I do funerals for folks who aren't doing real well, maybe they somewhere along the line tried to start the walk with Christ and maybe they stumbled along and maybe they fell off the end of the wagon and we're in front of the whole church. What are you going to say? You know what I say? Hebrews 11. If Samson made it, there's hope. That's what I say. Am I right in saying that? I don't know. I just know it's true. God's grace goes deeper than we think it does. Reaches farther than we can imagine. Can do things <laughs> to change us like nothing else can. But it must be received. Because I know there's a sinner whose prayer is not heard. And there's a sinner whose prayer is. I want to be a sinner whose prayer is heard. Don't you? David's sin is not something to rejoice in. It's something to learn from and confess. Sin's scars are not to display for pleasure. They're to confess with contrition in heart. And that is a sadness of guilt that says, oh Lord, thank you for the forgiveness of this. Help me walk in your ways more closely to you because of it. Romans 6.21 says it well. 
What benefit did you receive from those things you're now ashamed of? Those things result in what? Death. Sin leads to death. Think of Nadab and Abihu, Uzzah, Ananias and Sapphira sins. What was the result of those sins? Very clearly, in their own life, we saw, bang, death, right there, at the moment. And David, the child born in adultery, died. Absalom, one of his, I guess, favorite sons, died. Absalom killed Amnon first. <laughs> he died. His oldest son died. And then Adonijah was put to death by Solomon. David lost four sons, the sword, taking the lives of his sons. And God said it wouldn't depart from his house. Let me ask you this. If you knew, parents, if you knew that your sins would kill your kids, would that not motivate you to be more pure? Would it not? Would it motivate you to pray harder, be more righteous, follow Christ more fully? Could that happen? Should that be a deterrent to you? You say, God wouldn't do that. Reread David's story. We all need to pray the sinner's prayer, do we not? The Lord's prayer itself includes this. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And then he goes on to comment on that one statement. For if you forgive those who trespass against you, your Father will also get, forgive you. But if you do not forgive those who sin against you, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. That's a sinner's prayer. The sinner who's a forgiver of others has more hope of forgiveness himself or herself. At the end of David's life and for future generations, David's record of faithfulness won the day. I love that. David was faithful. He kept struggling. He did have some stumbles along the way, but he stayed faithful from that point on as best he could. Perhaps from then on, David prayed this sinner's prayer over. Maybe he wrote it out so he could read it again. And he shared it with others. He sought a righteous life. Forgiveness does not mean no consequences. That's the point here. Faithfulness triumphs in the end, though. Here's your closing illustration and the lesson's yours. Two men came to a small village one time, and they were they're rascals. They were sheep thieves. And they, this is a small village of sheep farmers. And one night they were caught stealing sheep. People's sheep are disappearing. Finally, they caught the two guys. They were taking them off and eating them. And this was no small matter in this particular town. Both these men were tried and sentenced to be branded on the forehead with the letters S-T, sheep thief. And after being branded, one of the men took off. And wherever he went, he got in trouble because of that brand on his head. He never overcame it. Finally, he was killed in a fight over what was wrong. The second man stayed in the village. He even got a job eventually with the farmer from whom he'd stolen the sheep and worked hard for him. He became known for his hard work and honesty as time passed. And the, the village grew eventually. He married and had a family there. One day, a stranger came to town and he and a, the, the thief and a guy was walking together and the stranger says, hey, what's that on your forehead? What does that mean? The old farmer was the one who was walking with him. And the old farmer stepped in front and said, oh, that means saint. <laughs> David faced the consequences of his sin. He stayed there and he lived a faithful life. He became known by all as the man after God's own heart. That's about as close to sainthood as you can get, isn't it? That's our task and goal in life. It should be as a Christian. Live for Christ. Remember the sins of your past. Don't fall into them again. And when you stumble in sin, get back up. Keep going. Keep walking with Christ. And know He will make you like Himself. He paid for you. He died for you. He bled. He gave it all up for you. Give it all up for Him. Give it up for Him. If you need to do that today, we invite you to come while we stand and sing to encourage you.
face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord as His countenance upon you and give you His peace. May the Lord cover all our sins and motivate us because of them to live more firmly and strongly for Him every day. In Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. A few announcements before we close out this morning. Grateful to see everyone this morning. If you're visiting with us, you're our honored guest, and we're grateful that you came our way today to, to worship with us, and I hope you will return again. Uh, a few announcements. Uh, I think most have seen the emails that have gone out postponing uh, our intern farewell this evening and our get-together here, and that has changed, so that will... The intern farewell will take place next week with the return to school prayer service, if I understand correctly. Following that, there will be a time in the fellowship hall, I think, for ice cream and refreshments, if I'm correct on that. Okay. <laughs> Couldn't see Kendall, so I was looking for somebody that could give me an okay. All right. Uh, since there's been changes, I know the 5 p.m., a uh, small group is going to meet down in the church office uh, building, so if you wish to join us, you may, and we will be on Samson this evening if you wish to join us. Uh, a note for Sec Secret Sisters, uh, there have been some gifts given without recipients' names on them, so uh, people are wondering who they may go to, so if you have put a gift downstairs on the Secret Sister table and not put a recipient. Please uh, uh, put the name of who that should go to, please. Uh, also, the questionnaires that we just handed out earlier, if you would, uh, return those to the elders before you leave today. Uh, you will not be able to leave the building if you don't. So. <laughs> I think that's what Butch said. That's right. That's right. And also, uh, last week there were some of these Q and A's. Some of you may want those. You may not. A little bit of uh, we're trying to uh, prevent any just general questions uh, in concern of we're, what we're doing right now with Greg's Greg's status and our search for a new minister. Uh, so uh, if you have if you have not picked those up, please do. Uh, it sort of answers a lot of those questions that you might have had. Also, see the elders if you have questions about that or speak to Greg or any of us concerning that situation. Uh, remember on our prayer list, our brother Joe and Joanne Spencer, uh, our sister Jan Thomas, uh, Angie Maynard. Uh, it's good to see Angie looking better and better, so that's great. So good to see her. And uh, Carol Mitchell, and uh, keep Carol in your prayers. I think Carol is... Got another little hurdle now with shingles, I believe. I was told that earlier. So please keep Carol uh, in your prayers. Uh, any other announcements that I may have missed? Okay. Uh, birthdays for this week. I have several birthdays. Uh, I don't see. Gabriella, she's, she's here somewhere. Gabriella's got a big birthday. All right, good. Uh, young ones this week, pretty young. I got one that's not. Gary Smith's got a birthday this week. All right. Uh, Boone Cochran, Boone's got a birthday this week. And uh, Grant, I don't see Grant, do I? Out of town. Okay. Grant Sutterfield turns a big 18, I believe, uh, this week. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's 17. Am I right? I think it's 18 now. 18? I thought so. Uh, and Claire Foster. Claire's got a big birthday this week, and I know they're going to have a big celebration for her. Any others that I might have missed? All right, let's close with a word of prayer, please. Father, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Father, mold us into a creation for your purpose and service. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.